I usually say welcome, but I'm in uh, someone else's <laughs> building today. So thanks for having us today. Um, and uh, welcome to our Rural Housing Trust Fund Advisory Committee meeting today. And before we get started, let's stay legal. Uh, as, is there a quorum present? There is a quorum, and the press has been notified. The press has been notified. Okay, we're good to go today. Um, since this is a relatively new entity and a lot of new faces here, I thought we'd, we'd open it up and just do introductions around the room. We'll start with our, our board members, if you don't mind. Tell us who you are, where you're from. My name's Ben Walmack, uh, from Store, Kentucky. I work at the People's Bank of Kentucky as a loan officer, and I'm also a director there. Uh, Robbie Mills, I'm state senator from Henderson. I represent Henderson Union Webster and Hopkins County. I'm Nikki Chambers, I'm from Hopkinsville, uh, Christian County. I work at Hopkinsville Water Environment Authority, and I'm also um, vice chair for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I am Tiffany Marfeller. I reside in Shelbyville, Kentucky, and I am the executive director of the Kentucky Affordable Housing Coalition. Uh, my name is Sam Thorner. I am the general counsel and deputy executive director for Kentucky Housing Corporation. Brian Quarles, uh, commissioner of agriculture. Winston Miller, uh, executive director of the Kentucky Housing Corporation. And uh, Wendy Smith, I'm deputy executive director over housing programs here at KHC. Uh, Johnny Turner, attorney of law and state senator for five counties. They got some of them got flooded. Floyd, Knott, Letcher, Arlen, and Bell. Sandy Curd, I'm with Kentucky Highlands Investment Corporation. We're based out of London, but my primary work works in the eight counties of southeastern Kentucky, which includes Harlan and Bell, Whitley, Clay, Leslie, Fletcher. And I can't even keep up with it. There we go. There we go. So. My name is Earl Rogers. I'm an attorney in uh, Boysville, Kentucky. Uh, I'm also on the board of directors Frontier House. I'm Fred Bashir. I'm with the Middlefork Financial Group, which is a three bank holding company in Leslie, Owsley, Lee, and Wolf counties. And uh, we have about $30 million worth of tax credit loans on our books. We are very active with that. That's, that's been one of our last days. Excellent. Uh, congratulations on your appointment, or however you ended up here today. So <laughs> I look forward to a great discussion as well. But uh, one thing I learned long ago in Frankfurt is that the staff are the most important people in the room. So I'd like to introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm Erin Kimla. I'm a staff attorney at the Kentucky Housing Corporation. I'm Kate McAfee. I'm Housing Policy and Program Administrator for Housing Programs. Uh, Curtis Stauffer, Managing Director of Housing Contract Administration. I've got EMP translated for bureaucracy as I oversee the teams that do homeless programs as well as single family development repair. Great. I'm Joe Bilby. I'm the General Counsel at the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. I'm Morgan Lunsford. Um, I'm the Commissioner's intern for this summer. I'm a junior at the University of Kentucky majoring in agriculture education. Day two of the job. Yes, day two of the job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nicia Patterson, Communications Assistant at Kentucky Housing Corporation. Great. Thank you for everything you all do as well. And uh, you have an agenda in front of you, but before we get started, you know, one thing that I think we all know about is that there's a shortage of housing all across Kentucky. And it's not just an urban issue that sometimes we see about or hear about, but it's really rural Kentucky. And uh, look at the double whammy that Kentucky's hit with the tornadoes and floods, and you all uh, come from those areas. I mean, there's some serious work ahead of us, and so I'm, I'm appreciative of the General Assembly uh, for taking time to, to notice this, and that's a great uh, advisory council that's going to specifically uh, deal with this. So, really appreciate that. And we have some work to do before us. Uh, I come from Scott County. And so we're the fastest growing county in Kentucky, so there's always been a housing shortage uh, where I come from with Toyota and now Lexus. And so when we talk about economic development, when we talk about recruiting businesses, uh, it's, it's becoming just as important as whether or not you have electricity, water, or high speed internet. And so it's, it's beyond basic human needs. It's about can we have, do we have the capacity to help build uh, the rural Kentucky as well. And so I really appreciate it. You all serve in this capacity, but we'll move on here to an adoption of the Rural Housing Trust Fund Advisory Committee Charter. Thank you. 
So um, before we talk about the charter specifically, I thought I'd give a brief overview of how, how we got here. So um, this, the Rural Housing Trust Fund was established by the General Assembly in March of 2023, um, signed by the governor, uh, through House Bill 360, um, and in conjunction with House Bill 448. Um, this fund was initially funded with $20 million from the state aid for um, funding for emergencies, the SAFE funds, $10 million from Western Kentucky, and $10 million for Eastern Kentucky. And so this was created to invest in rural housing solutions. Um, you all know this advisory committee was created also by the legislation. Um, it's comprised of eight members. Um, the Commissioner of Agriculture is the presiding officer, two members from the Senate, two members from the House of Representatives, and then the six private citizens who were appointed by the KHC Board of Directors who live in rural communities. Uh, members serve three-year terms, and the committee consults with and advises KHC officers and directors on rural housing matters, matters related to the Rural Housing Trust Fund. So, um, the, one of the one of the items that, that is authorized by the by the legislation is um, for this committee to create its own rules, and so that's that's what this charter essentially does. It's available in your um, in your binder, um, the draft, and um, most of the information is, is pulled straight from the legislation. Um, I'm happy to go through any items in particular that anyone might have a question about, um, but. At, that, at this point, I'll give it back to the Commissioner for any questions. Yeah. Um, flip through here. See any questions? It's pretty straightforward. Is your name twice a year? Yes. Uh, any questions or edits? Or? You know, it might be helpful just to share that this is to some the legislation and then this charter are largely patterned after the existing affordable housing trust fund. So they're they're nearly identical. The legislation is it's not totally identical, but nearly and these charters are also similar. Yeah. Yes. It looks like I know what I'm talking about because these folks came off office yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any questions on the charter? If not, we'll kind of motion in the second. So, so we move with Senator Mills there. Second. The second. Second by Senator Turner. Any questions or discussion on the charter? The motion is second on the floor. Let's proceed to vote. All those in favor say aye, please. Aye. Uh, any opposed, the same. Motion passes. Congratulations. We have a charter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll get you a, a, a one to sign, and then we'll update everyone's uh, folder with the signed version once. Uh, at the next meeting, I guess. All right. Good deal. All right. Wendy, I... Yeah, if it's... You know, I can't decide if I should do it from here. Or I'll go up to the <laughs> That's easy for everybody. So, um, y'all are going to have to listen to me more than anybody else have to. But um, I'm going to share a little bit about Kentucky Housing Corporation, just because not everybody knows what the heck we are and who the heck we are. But then I'm really, really going to get into the meat of the Rural Housing Trust Fund, what is um, kind of set out in the legislation, but then what also we are recommending as kind of the policy design. Um, and where we, uh, there are a couple points in particular where we really want some input from this committee, but I also know you all are going to have questions or suggestions as we get into some of the details. So a little bit about KHC. Next slide. So um, we are a quasi-state agency, so we are you know, attached to the administration, but we are not state employees. Um, so we're not in the budget. We are self-supporting. We, we have a board of directors. Uh, Commissioner Quarles has recently become part of our board of directors. Um, and that board of directors is made up of some folks who are ex officio, you know, just by virtue of their position, but then also some that are appointed by the governor. So it's a mix of, of private citizens and people who have different offices. We are self-supporting, meaning we do not get any general fund dollars from the state. We administer HUD programs, we do mortgage lending, we, we earn money or fees through the work that we do, but we do not get any ongoing support from the state to do our work. Um, and we are what's called a state housing finance agency. Every state has one, and we are, it gives us certain, we have bonding capabilities, and we are uh, assigned to do different housing programs on behalf of the Commonwealth. 
So um, what we do in general is take funds from private sources, federal and state sources, and then distribute them out across the state. Usually that is through some kind of partner, a, a mortgage originator, a mortgage broker, a bank, um, a developer, a nonprofit organization. It, it really depends on what the program is, who our partners are. Uh, but we rarely do we directly <coughs> offer assistance across Kentucky. It is usually through some kind of partner. Um, the exception to that would be we are the Section 8 Public Housing Authority for Section 8 vouchers for 87 counties <coughs> that don't have their own public housing authority, and we directly work with tenants and landlords. Another exception would be during the pandemic when um, there was a lot of worry that people were going to get evicted and landlords weren't ever going to get paid their rent. We distributed through a pandemic rent assistance program funded by Treasury um, $260 million that we paid out to landlords and utilities across the state, and we did that directly. But usually we are working through partners, and that's really how we get the bulk of our work done is through different kinds of partners. And there's really three big areas of the work that we do. We work with home buyers and existing homeowners, so we do mortgages. Um, we do it, again, through banks, through mortgage companies, and that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of times that those mortgages come with down payment assistance. Sometimes, depending on the funding for the mortgages, the interest rate is even a little bit lower than the regular interest rates. We do foreclosure prevention. We have a big pandemic-funded foreclosure prevention program going on right now. Um, we do home building. So we fund a lot of habitats. We fund a lot of organizations across East Kentucky to build houses for new home buyers, for new homeowners. We also do home repair, which means you have an existing owner whose house is falling into disrepair. Um, they might need a roof, they might need HVAC, and we fund that work with existing homeowners. And then we do what's called weatherization, energy efficiency improvements to bring down the utility bills for homeowners because that's, in fact, one of the cheapest and quickest ways to make a home more affordable for the person <coughs> is to get that utility bill down. Um, we also do this big bucket of rental housing, and that is both we fund the development or the rehab of rental properties all across the state. Low-income housing tax credits is one of the ways that we do that. Um, we also have some other grant programs that fill development gaps. But we also do rent assistance. I mentioned the 87 counties that we do Section 8 vouchers for. We also have a separate, what's called a project-based contract with HUD, where we pay rent on 22,000 units around the state. Um, those are projects that are subsidized by HUD, so, so multifamily properties, complexes. It's not a voucher someone can take anywhere. They, they are fixed to the property. Okay, and then the last bucket is our homeless programs and other special programs. Um, HUD has something with what they call um, the continuum of care for homelessness. It's meant to be a network of service providers, shelter, housing, services, health care. Kentucky has three continua of care, Louisville, Lexington, and then the other 118 counties, <laughs> which is a little bit preposterous, but it gives us some advantages when we're going after money. Anyway, we are the administrator of the, uh, a competitive application to HUD every year for, it's more than 30 partners across the state, and we bring in those dollars and grant them out to the homelessness shelters, service agencies, street outreach, um, and we do that across the whole state. So we kind of serve as the administrative body for that, but they have a board, and, and those, those member agencies do a lot of that leadership, but we staff that for them. Um, okay, next. So I'm not gonna go through this in detail. This is meant to give you the rundown. In fiscal year 22, these are the dollars that we got out across Kentucky. It comes to a little over $1.3 billion. You will see a lot of that is in our mortgage lending and associated efforts. That's the bulk of the, the money that flows through us. But coming right under that is our multifamily investments. When you take the tax credit and value it over the 10 years that it's taken, that's your rough annual um, investment of those funds. But you will see we also have significant investments in other areas. The rent subsidized units for our Section 8 programs, $148 million a year. And then $161 million is how much we got out in pandemic rent assistance in FY22, that crossover over several years. I'm mainly just trying to give you all a sense of 
Behind every one of these line items is a bunch of other funding sources and a bunch of other detail. I'm not going to bore you with it. I just wanted you all ha to have a sense of why the heck is this Rural Housing Trust Fund coming to the Kentucky Housing Corporation? And it is because we do administer for the Commonwealth a bunch of different programs for housing. And the hope would be is that the Rural Housing Trust Fund dollars, in some cases, might be even braid with some of these other resources or sit next to them. Next slide, please. Okay, and then just to share with you all, in terms of our mission, we really have two big strategic focus areas right now, and they're, they're related. Um, one, it's, it, the main thing is to help Kentucky meet its two most urgent housing issues, and those are twofold. There's a severe shortage of units that are available to low, moderate, and middle income Kentuckians. We are short a lot of different unit types across this state, not just for our poorest Kentuckians, although they are often the ones who suffer the most when there's a shortage because they can't compete when rents keep going up or home prices keep going up. We need a lot of different types of housing at a bunch of different ranges, uh, different price points and income ranges. We, we are really, really short. Since the 08 recession, our state and our nation lost builder capacity. A lot of builders just went out of business, didn't go back, couldn't get credit to start building again, and we have not returned to that level of construction. Meanwhile, we've had household growth, and we need more units across, across the country. It's not a Kentucky problem, but it is in Kentucky as well as the rest of the country. So that, and related to that, is disaster recovery in eastern and west Kentucky, which is exacerbating the existing shortage, right? We lost a lot of units, and a lot of them are severely damaged, if not destroyed, and so these two things go together. Next slide. Okay, so um, with, given the, the context of disaster recovery, and I wanna make sure that you all know, the Rural Housing Trust Fund right now is funded only with SAFE dollars, which were disaster recovery dollars for East and West Kentucky. 10 million for East, 10 million for West. So while it is a rural housing trust fund that um, it, the legislation kind of contemplates that in the future maybe other dollars will flow into it, right now the only dollars in it are for disaster recovery for East and West Kentucky. So that's it's kind of two things at once, right? It's a rural housing trust fund, but the money is, is disaster money. So I want to give you all a little bit of context about how this, the rural housing trust fund, in our, our aim, will aid with disaster recovery in the East and West Kentucky. So, um, just so you all know, since the tornado hit in West Kentucky, KHC has been at agency meetings with Kentucky Emergency Management, Red Cross, FEMA, and then Transportation, many other state agencies. Our role happens a lot later, but I have to say, uh, we've all gotten a crash course at KHC in disaster recovery, and what are the mechanics of this, and how do you work with all the federal agencies and the volunteer entities. But we have been part of it from uh, that December of 21? Yeah. Uh, and the first thing that we did was we did an inventory of available rental units. I mentioned how many units we pay rent on, right? And we have funded a lot of rent. So we just started calling all these properties that we pay rent on, and we inspect them every year, we have relationships, and we said, did you have any damage? And if you didn't, do you have any available units? And we built a map. First for West Kentucky, we did it later for East Kentucky, where you could look and just find, there's a unit here available, it's got two bedrooms. And for most of our properties, we were allowed to relax like income guidelines if you were a disaster survivor. So we just tried to figure out, could we like let people know units that were available in the short term. We, again, we meet regularly. We still do meet with fellow state agencies about disaster recovery. We're now turning to be focused more on the rebuilding, less on that, that response time. So our role is really you know, beginning to, to grow. Um, we granted over $700,000 of our own discretionary dollars. We have a, a little bit of money that we're allowed to grant out that we've earned through our mortgages. And we did that to nonprofits in East and West Kentucky for a couple of reasons. So we did this for a couple of habitats out in West Kentucky that we work with, and then for four agencies in East Kentucky. These are existing partners of ours, and we did it because um, some of them had their offices flooded. Many of them halted all work on our programs just to help people muck out, you know, recover. But we need them to survive this disaster. And the way we typically pay our nonprofit partners is you build a house, we pay you what we call a developer fee. We'll pay you for production. 
well, we know their production, at least for a, a good few months, was not going to be what it was, and they might lose that revenue stream they were accustomed to. In addition, almost everyone we granted money to is a member of one or more long-term recovery groups, which is a, I never knew what they were, but it's a key part to disaster recovery. Some of them are even leading like the housing portion of their long-term recovery groups. We need them doing that work. They're going to be essential to long-term recovery. So we, we granted those funds just to keep them staffed and keep them from, we cannot lose their capacity. In some of the counties they work in, they are the primary developer or they're the only housing developer. So we cannot lose their capacity. In fact, we, we need them to grow capacity. Um, we meet often with a lot of these partners as well as some others. Many of them are already rehabbing houses, rebuilding houses. They already use our money to do this kind of work. Many of them reprogram some of the grants they had from us to focus on disaster survivors. We, we offered some additional flexibilities where we could. So we are talking with them a lot. In fact, before I share these program details with you all, you know, I will, I will share that we have met with our East Kentucky partners, our West Kentucky partners, and multifamily developers to share with them our draft kind of program design because they're the ones who are going to do it. They've, they've got to feel like it's, it makes sense and that it's, it's workable for them and it's going to let them move fast. Um, okay, and then we have, we have also been working with the Department for Local Government to draft plans for the housing portion um, of the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery, CDBGDR, uh, money that is coming to East Kentucky. And I'll, the next slide kind of touches on that. So after the West Kentucky tornado and the East Kentucky flooding, there were federally declared disasters and then they were deemed severe enough that those disasters received a grant of Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funds from HUD. Um, these are meant for long-term rebuilding. It's not emergency response money. It hasn't even started to get spent yet. But it was $123.9 million for West Kentucky and the 21 flooding in East Kentucky. And then $298 million for the flooding in East Kentucky. Now, these funds aren't just housing dollars. It's housing, economic development, infrastructure, and disaster mitigation. So there are a lot of buckets. We, for East Kentucky, not for West Kentucky, we are going to be the administrator of the housing portion of the CDBGTR. This is more money than the Department for Local Government gets in this, these type of funds for five to, well, no, oh, 10 years. This is about 10 years worth of, of their funding. So it, this is, um, we are expecting a lot of our local communities in East and West Kentucky. We're expecting a lot of DLG. And some of that is now being, you know, um, allocated to KHC. So a lot's going to be expected of us too. This is a lot of money, but it does not move quickly. Uh, you have to submit a plan. You have to get it approved. It's, it's, it's important because of the volume of dollars and, how, and all the things you can do with it. It unfortunately does not move quickly enough. So next slide. The Rural Housing Trust Fund. We are so thrilled about this, and we know that a lot of our East and West Kentucky partners lobbied for it because this can be the gap between the Red Cross and FEMA really short-term assistance and that HUD money that's coming but isn't available yet. We feel like the Rural Housing Trust Fund can help accelerate getting some stuff done and really um, allowing our partners to grow their capacity, their construction crews, their staff, get them going so that they are ramping up, getting stuff done, ramping up their teams and their capacity and when this money flows, they've already got more production happening. That's our, that's our goal. Um, so we really think that this Rural Housing Trust Fund is this like, it's just a great investment by the state that will hopefully be a springboard so that the HUD money gets moving even faster. The CDBG funds are still going to be administered by uh, DLG, right? Or is that you mean regular CDBG? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. the, but the, the new funds, these disaster fund is that still yet to be determined no it will so it will be dlg that money's coming to dlg for east kentucky the housing cdbgdr is going to flow to us okay, okay and we will oversee it for east kentucky. just because i mean dlg is just i know it, it just got so much it really makes sense for you to do both of them yeah. Yeah. well i'm not asking for that <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be i guess it's I going am. to be daunting as it is so uh, but but, and they do already have, the Western Kentucky money has already been, the plan's been approved by HUD, and they have started to release funding rounds. So they are a lot further along with that. But, um, but we, 
it is a gift. It's also like ask us again in a couple of years if we feel like it was a good thing for East Kentucky to come to us, but we feel like it makes sense. Um, and when we've got to add to the capacity, the Commonwealth's capacity, just get that money out compliantly. Yeah. So any questions about that before we uh, dig into the Rural Housing Trust Fund? I just kind of wanted to frame up for you all. Like, we really see this as an important bridge between that shorter term money and the longer term money. I had a couple questions. Yeah. So you work with a lot of partners. How do you determine who your partners are? And how's yeah. It so it really depends on the program, right? So if you're talking about single family lending, we have a whole process for certifying par underwriters and, and, and banks that uh, originate our mortgages. If you're talking about the low income housing tax credit and building multifamily rental properties, we have a capacity review process and folks apply and compete for those tax credits. Um, when you're talking about our single family programs, they also go through, it's a different capacity review because how we look at a, a habitat building 10 homes a year versus a multifamily developer building 100 units, you know, that's quite different, but we still have a capacity review process. And then of course, we're gonna look at their articles of incorporation or if they're for profit, you know, their secretary of state, uh, good standing, that kind of stuff. So we have a lot of processes in place for conflict of interest, for underwriting the, the company as well as the project, but it really does depend on the funding stream. How many employees do you have? 302 right now? I think that's, yeah. But keep in mind, we do in-house loan servicing, so we've got a lot of employees who have to be here to accept you know, payments, and then we do $1.3 billion worth of programs. Now, during the pandemic, that got close to 400 because we were doing rent assistance, but we have onboarded and then offboarded. Just curious, out of those two, uh, 302, how many are working from home and how many are coming to the office? Uh, I would guess about 30% are in the office and the rest now. Keep in mind, we have people who already work. From home. They already did because we have inspectors. Yeah. We have folks whose job is to be out in the field. Yeah. And just, I will say that the remote work has allowed us to recruit really good talent from places where, like we have a manager, she lives in Hazard. She would have never applied to us if she had to drive in every day. But now her team works across courtrooms, um, helping landlords and tenants like maybe work out a deal so that people don't get evicted. So her staffs, none of them come in either. And it, it has really worked out um, better than we would have expected. It's an interesting debate in government work. I mean, we've had it going on for about a year, yeah. and it's uh, it's interesting how some people can manage that and other people can't manage. It. Well, and it's it's built by the team. Like all of our loan servicing and accounting folks, they're in here every day. You know, they have to be here. But then some of our, we have an inspections team, we would never make them come in because they're far flung all of, So it kind of depends on, does the work really necessitate being in office? So it's not one policy across KHC, I want to make that clear. It's right. kind of department to department. Question for you, Andrew. Yeah. I like this diagram explaining the, the gap in time that these funds can help fill. When is the soonest that we could realistically expect <laughs> that last bunch of money to yeah. come into play. Right. So for West Kentucky, it's available, right? For West Kentucky, you can now apply to the Department for Local Government for project funding. Um, for East Kentucky, you have to submit an act, DLG will submit an action plan to HUD. We have submitted the housing portion to DLG and their consultant, and they have most of their pieces done. To be honest with you, they're waiting on FEMA data, because you have to include FEMA data in this plan and it hasn't been made available from FEMA yet. So I would say if, if everything worked magically, it'd be this fall. That would be the absolute, that would be the radically soonest uh, date possible that the CDBG DR for East Kentucky could be available. Wendy, about how much in the plan that you submitted for East Kentucky, what proportion of the $398 million is going towards housing? Well, we roughly estimated about 60%, but it, that is a really fungible number, please keep in mind, because what we haven't figured out yet is, are we going to have infrastructure coded or defined as a separate cost when it is tied to housing, or are we going to move that money over and call it housing money? So there are, there are some items that, to be honest with you, you submit it, and then we've asked for, you have to set, DLG will set a threshold to say what is a substantial change that would require going back to HUD for approval and we recommended setting that at 10 million dollars because 
things could just change so much and you don't want to have to go back to HUD every time you're seeking. I'm not saying 10 million is not much money, but in the scheme of 300 million, it's it's a small shift, you know. But so right now it's 60%, but that could look bigger or smaller depending on how the infrastructure costs get tied. What's the what's the money called on Joe's question? The Western Kentucky money that's available, you, you call it project funding. What's it? It's the it's community development block grant disaster recovery okay. for the 2021 disasters. Okay. And if you um, you all will have my contact information or I get you. I can even send you the DLG has a website where they have all those applications. Okay. Available. I just wanted to make sure if somebody asked me yeah. that they know that it's available. Yeah, it's, and sure it's DLG. Them. Yeah, yeah. A lot of that is pretty recent. Within the last month, those have gone out. Those funding yeah. There's a lot of grants out there right now. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Keep going. Okay, so um, I want to share with you all kind of the policies that would apply across a any RHTF activity, whether it's single family or multifamily. There are some things that based on the legislation, it's just going to apply to anything. So the legislation sets forth funding priorities. So again, these are not negotiable. They're just they're what's in the legislation. And those are that the projects um, are located in federally declared disaster areas. Again, these are priorities. It's, we're not saying every project has to meet every one of these, but these are the priorities for funding. So in a federally declared disaster area, um, Projects submitted by nonprofit organizations or local governments for new rural housing. Projects using existing privately owned housing stock, so you buy a vacant house and rehab it. Projects using existing publicly, I'm sorry, that's duplicative. Sorry about that. That's, that's, that's a typo. And then the last one is projects submitted by local governments demonstrating effective zoning, conversion, or demolition controls for single room occupancy units. I'll be honest with you, I do not know what this last one is exactly about. That's just straight from the legislation. Um, it was a copy from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and I don't know if, I guess it's or, like it's effective zoning, conversion, or demolition for single room occupancy. This last one is a bit of a mystery to me, but that's verbatim from the legislation. Okay, so how much is available? $20 million, again, 10 for East Kentucky, 10 for West Kentucky. And so what we did is we took the, uh, because these are safe funds, which were for the disasters, we're gonna focus on the designated disaster counties for East and West Kentucky. <clears throat> the way we wanna do this, and this gets into some policy stuff, so I welcome your all's feedback. We, in our focus, are allocating the full 10 million in East Kentucky for single family housing. That could be building new housing or repairing, restoring, elevating existing housing. All of that to single family. For West Kentucky, we want to split it five million to single family, five million to multifamily. Here's why. In West Kentucky, a lot of folks had home insurance, a far higher rate than in East Kentucky. And home insurance covers a tornado, it doesn't cover flooding. So we've got far more homeowners who were able to get going on restoring their units in West Kentucky. We also lost a, quite a few multifamily complexes, also single family homes that were rental in West Kentucky. And we see a big need to have some of these funds support multifamily development. In addition, we are getting ready with Department for Local Government to do a funding round for rental apartment development in West Kentucky with our tax credits, our taxes and bonds, ideally this Rural Housing Trust Fund, and a portion of the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Money that I was just talking about. So that would go, those that would get packaged together and be available for West Kentucky development. Um, so that, that's kind of implicit in that are those kind of policy thoughts. We also are recommending a, an award per applicant, so a developer, let's say, um, like the Housing Development Alliance in Hazard, of 2.5 million. Now, I want to make it clear, that's more than we would typically award through a funding round to anybody, but what do we want here? We want speed and we want scale. We want existing partners who've already proven they can build single family houses or multifamily. We want them to get it done fast and get as many units as possible. 
question. Yeah. Is Eastern Kentucky basically then going to depend on the hazard group to apply to or talk to these if any of the developers there will be? No, sir. I think there will be quite a few. I think that um, uh, Homes Inc. out of Whitesburg will right. be an applicant. I think HDA. I think it's possible the housing partnership out of um, um, Owsley County will apply. I, I think there will be a number of nonprofits that go after these funds. Well, it's, it's primarily not in uh, Letcher and Perry. Perry uh, yeah, Perry and uh, one of the brands. Yeah, at least four, right? Yeah. Two and a half million dollars. Yeah. 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 And that money will be available for that application. You mean when will the application come out? Yeah. Well, you're stealing my thunder. That's my last slide. Uh, well, <laughs> but I'm going to be answering the questions of the county sure. judges and the mayor sure. and those people. No, our them. aim and part of the reason, right, this legislation passed in March. We are meeting in June, right? And and you don't know, well, you, you, can, you have a sense of, we've had many staff meetings, meetings with partners. Like, we want to get this going fast. So our aim would be to put the funding round out. Ideally, it would be in Ju uh, early July. That we would get it out and we, what our thought is is that we would do two deadlines one it would be like a one month deadline for people who already have site control they're ready to go they just need money they can apply to, at that for one month and then maybe the next deadline is two months later so that those who need a little time to get their project together don't have to rush but they still have a shot at the next bucket of dollars if that makes sense so they need to be contacting those agencies though it's going to get the funding right yes. away and get yeah okay and i'll be honest with you because we want to move fast we would like to focus on working with existing partners partners who've already used our state affordable housing trust fund tax credits other funds who already know how to make it happen they can partner with anybody they can partner with home builders or what have local governments but we'd like to work with existing partners who just they know how our processes work because our real our big aim is speed Question is, from my review of this, this, this was my biggest question yeah. in Western Kentucky about the 50-50 uh, split yeah. on money. Sure. And I agree, and your explanation helps a lot. Uh, and I agree, we, in Dawson Springs, you know, we lost uh, affordable uh, public housing, public housing yeah. and, and there was at least three or four, uh, you know, probably 12 or 15 unit type mm -hmm. apartment complexes that were wiped out as well. And I agree with the idea of loaning more uh, than normal to get it going because that's the biggest, our biggest concern is just people have left the area and if we don't get housing stock right. going and get people, especially people that may have been on assistance, uh, if we don't get something there, they're gonna be gone for, for good. So I agree with that. The developer that's gonna do that, if they happen to loan, if you happen to loan out uh, 1. 5, or 2.5 million, how much of their private funds would have to go with that money? It really is going to depend on the project because they may well use some of our tax credits, which is where they get a private investor. So I don't, do you call that the developer's money? Yeah, it's really yeah, the yeah, investor's it's, money, right? It's not government money. Right, that's what I'm right. Sure. It, will, it will kind of depend on um, how DLG is going to look at funding projects, but it could be, I think DLG is looking at 3 million per project, can you remember? I think so. Same. So the maximum <laughs> might be a 5.5 5. 5 in grant, dollars. and then you might have some tax credits, and then they might have a bank loan next to that. Thank you. Yeah, and it all will get written, the multifamily, as a loan to the project. But it, but it might kind of um, be forgiven at the end of the term. So if it stays affordable for 30 years, then that loan might be forgiven. But it's, it's a loan while it's in its compliance. Is there a maximum on single family? Is it $75,000 or $100,000? We'll see in a sec. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions about just this breakdown before we... When, when the yeah. Was Western Kentucky rental, and I agree there's a lot bigger need for rental in Western Kentucky, uh, do we know about how many units were uh, taken out of circulation and how many of this might produce back? I, I really can't answer that. I mean, we did an analysis for DLG when we were trying to show if they use this CDBGDR, so not these, but their, their funds that are going to go with these, if they use them by themselves versus if they use them alongside our tax credits and other funds, 
how many they could get, but I'm, I'll be honest, I don't know it off the top of my head, Billy. You can email me and I'll, I, can, I can look it up for you, but um, you know how it's going to be. It's going to depend on the value of the credits sure. and how much of the, of the DLG money comes into play. Next slide. So the geography, and I'm going to show you all a map so you don't have to worry about this as much, but I want to make sure you all know um, we have a couple of different um, overlays for geography. One is the legislation says it's supposed to be rural. Let's put a pin in that because uh, we are going to want to talk about that with you all in a sec. Um, and, and we've used for our affordable housing trust fund, that regular fund, 60% of those dollars have to go into rural areas or 40%. Can't remember, it's 60 or 40, um, and we use the USDA uh, definition, the U U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, so then, when we talk about East and West Kentucky, we want to focus on the counties that were designated in the federal disasters that were eligible for FEMA individual assistance. This is getting a little like wonk policy wonky, but there was public assistance, which is like you know debris removal and kind of general FEMA help for governments. Individual assistance was where FEMA help went to households. It means there was even more damage in those counties. And then where you see that it's bold and it's got the star, those are what are called the HUD, most impacted and distressed areas, the counties that got the greatest damage is what, what those are. So ne the next slide has a One map. Question, oh, correction. Yeah. Um, for, for Western Kentucky, it's actually Warren County. I'm sorry. It, thank you, Sam. <laughs> it's actually I Warren County that's the, that's the I kept putting in Barron so So it's Warren. Hopkins, Graves, and yes. Warren County. Yeah. It's not bare. No, it's not bare. I was going to say, I was surprised. No, no, it's more, I'm it's sorry, more my apologies. Yeah. So uh, these are the counties, uh, and the ones that are shaded the darkest, uh, although Warren should be and Barron should not be, are those most impacted. Um, so it's a lot of counties, but it's not every rural area in Kentucky. I want to make sure that that's clear to everybody. Next slide. So I'm going to let Sam talk about this. So this is something that, that we wanted to, to bring up to the committee. The Rural Housing Trust Fund um, enabling statutes do not provide a definition of the term rural. Um, there is another part of the, of the statutory framework that does under the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is also administered by KHC. Um, KHC is tasked with providing a definition for the term rural because a portion of those AHTF funds need to be used in rural counties. So um, historically, KHC has, has set that definition as the same definition for the United States Department of Agriculture Rural Development. Um, the, the 23 regular session House Bill 448 was the bill that transferred the funds from the East, Eastern Kentucky and Western Kentucky SAFE funds. Um, for rural housing units located in the areas named under the pre Presidential Disaster Declaration. So there's a little bit of an overlap where we, we're, we're tasked with um, providing help for rural counties and the regular, the, the House Bill 448 um, uses the Presidential Disaster Declaration designation which includes some areas that are urban, um, technically. So, under, under the definition that we've used. So, the question that has been posed to us from some of our partners is, you know, would it be possible for KHC to grant a waiver? For example, if there's a, if there's a property in Warren County, um, it, might, it might technically fall under the USDA RD definition of urban, but it might not necessarily be in a highly populated area. Would KHC be allowed to grant an exception in that, in that sort of a circumstance. So that's something that we wanted, a question that we wanted to pose to you all, how, how we define rural and, and you know, whether or not we should, we should be granting waivers to that definition. I, I probably feel the strongest about that. I mean, uh, Bowling Green, in my opinion, is not rural in Warren County. I mean, I know there's areas in Warren County that are rural, but I think the intent is really rural, which would be uh, in Western Kentucky, would be all those counties except for Warren County. That, that's just my opinion, but I'm just one. So I believe Henderson also. Yeah, and, and you could probably throw in Henderson in there too, but we did not. We did not have. Uh, yeah, we're not on that. Yeah, yeah. But, Hopkinsville um, is, is considered urban. Is it? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And from, from my perspective, I think that big list you had earlier on there has got pretty much all of rural eastern Kentucky. There's some more counties that are rural in eastern Kentucky that didn't get hit at all. Yeah. And then it's not on that list. But the only way I think you could rectify that would be if the, if the, if the tornado occurred in whatever county got annihilation that you might could put a different mm -hmm. put something in the language that said in any other county that it definitely the warren county yeah. but I, but the problem but the thing that i see is that warren well, county is limited been, to that area though that got the you know if you had a cloud burst over as i always said if election got 12 inches of rain they'd be pumping water out of rough arena oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they ain't got no streams or no coverage, no where for it to go. But the idea that Warren County probably has the ability to recover from something like that a lot better than rest of rural rural Kentucky would have. I mean, it's more appealing for a developer to build uh, apartments and apartment complexes. I would hate to see 2.5 million of the funds go into Warren County to develop apartments, even though I know they need it and they're short on housing. Uh, that's just me kind of being greedy for really rural Kentucky and specifically my district in West End, Dawson Springs is definitely needs assistance. Well, I'll give you an example. This The reason we're even bringing this to you all is when we shared our draft kind of uh, program design with partners, the Habitat for Humanity of Bowling Green and Warren County said, well, we've got a property, it's right on the edge of the city of Bowling Green. It's technically urban, but it is right at the edge. It's almost into the county. And we said, we hadn't really contemplated stuff like that, and we hadn't thought about City Hopkinsville. What we want is not a policy that says, we, it's, do, can we consider a waiver process if it's kind of rule-like, it, you know, it feels like it, it meets the spirit of it, even if it's not exactly the USDA. And we, but you know, we wanted your all's feedback on that. I'd say as long as it's not a 100% you know, waiver and you get it every time. I mean, yeah. if it's if it's really debated and yeah. and thought through, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But. One thing I want to say is I'm I'm sitting here for Brandon Smith, Robin Webb, Philip Wheeler, Fivers, and Brandon Storm. Basically, it's got all those counties mm -hmm. in eastern Kentucky that gets flooded. You know, from Knox to Whitley to. So that's who I'm basically speaking for when I'm talking about rural Eastern Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I don't think there are any urban areas in East Kentucky, right? I think you all are all covered. Yeah, there wouldn't even need be waivers anywhere in East Kentucky. I think. I have to say that so I don't get jumped on one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Christian County's had three tornadoes this year, or approximately two, really, that caused a lot of damage. And I mean, there are definitely rural areas of Christian County. And we had the sirens and all that the other night for tornadoes that you saw them coming up on the map. They just, I mean, luckily we didn't get them there in Harlan County. They were coming right through Bell County and Middleborough, right coming out of Tennessee. I think uh, I agree with Senator Mills. I think Bowling Green can sort of recover easier on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, but it might be situations where shovel ready projects you don't have enough shovel ready in other parts of western kentucky mm -hmm. that, that has one shovel yeah. ready that you might you know, be a good exception to make yeah i think the idea of, tr of speed probably trumps you know if it comes down to getting the money out and getting it going i mean yeah. if, if we're waiting a year to do something in dawson springs then i'd say we just missed the boat. I mean, they've got to be ready. To, right, but to don't. me, if we've got equally ready projects, yeah. we ought to lean toward rule. rule. Yeah. Uh, we just would like the, the waiver ability, particularly if it, gosh, this really feels like a rural spot, but it's technically considered, you know, part of the city of Hopkinsville, or part of the city of Old Green. Um, I, it, only because partners brought it up is why we wanted to raise it with you all. Good question. 
I, I, I'm sorry, I would go on the line that it would just be far easier if it was distinctly without waivers and rural. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that Habitat for Humanity can find uh, resources to be able to deal with that one. I think the city could come up with resources to be able to deal with that. And I believe that our urban partners have resources available to them that rules don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would be inclined to say let's not even make it one of those things that we have to worry about and try to decide what's rural enough and what feels rural and what isn't, those types of things. I would just leave it plain and say it was rural. And from the damage in Eastern Kentucky, you're going to have enough years ahead of you. Oh, yeah. You ain't yeah. going to have no extra money to fund no way. Right. And that's what I was about to say. As long as there's no yeah. money left on the table, you know, that would be the big thing. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be money left on the table. I, I not really. Not really. Yeah. Not during my lifetime, you're going to with Eastern Kentucky. I, I mean, we, when we met with Commissioner Quarles yesterday, you know, this is one time funding, as far as we know, for this trust fund. We said, you know, it could be gone. It could be committed to projects that get going uh, by the end of the year, and then there's no more trust. Fund. You know, there's we're just monitoring and getting stuff done, but we're not allocating anymore. It's very conceivable. That that would be a hope, actually. Uh, I, I have a feeling that we'll put more money in it than budget fund. Oh really? Yeah, I, do. I, just, I think, just I think this next term we'll put more in. Especially for Eastern Kentucky, I think mm -hmm. most of the members in Eastern Kentucky are asking for more housing help. Okay. So I think we're going to be spending money uh, in this budget oh, on okay. off, off budget. I don't even know how to feel about that. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> no, it's, it really is. Because of its flexibility, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, okay, so we keep going? I feel like we've heard from you all, like, keep it rule. Unless we feel like we really need you all to consider, you know, uh, some other approach, we'll focus on rural areas. Okay. So who's eligible to apply? This is straight from the legislation. So it's nonprofit housing organizations, uh, local governments, and then private for-profit developers and businesses that undertake the new construction or rehab of rural housing units for moderate income individuals and public housing authorities. This is roughly the same as the Affordable Housing Trust Fund with the addition of for-profits. And this was actually something we asked for because particularly for um, multifamily development, larger scale, you know, you're doing 20 units to 50 units, for-profits for are our primary partners for those kind of projects. And we really needed them to be able to. And when you're doing tax credits, you need a for-profit entity to be part of the tax credit deal. Next slide. Okay. The income is far uh, roomier than any other program we administer at KHC. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund, uh, our regular trust fund for housing, is limited to households that earn 60% of area median income or below. And when you are in a, a already fairly low income county, that can be a really, really low income. A lot of our partners have said it's really hard to serve a family where like both parents work and stay at that 60% level. In addition, disasters do not care what your income is, right? Tornadoes and floods hit people of lots of ranges of incomes and middle income folks still had some of the same, you know, insurance and, and property issues and they need help. And so the legislation uh, allows us to go up to the greater, well, it allows us to go up to 120% of median family income. It doesn't exactly define it, so here is how we are defining it. And this mirrors what we do for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. It's the greater of either the Kentucky median family income or the county's median income as set by HUD, whichever is higher. Why? We, we want to have room to serve as many kinds of households as possible. Because this is about disaster recovery, not just about serving the lowest income Kentuckians. Next slide. This is just to give you a sampling of what that looks like uh, in Kentucky. And so what you will see, whenever you see this 64,800, that's the state. That is where we're reverting to the state median income by household size. And so uh, in Barron County, a family of three could make up to $83,000 and buy a house or rent a unit uh, that was funded by the Rural Housing Trust Fund. That's much higher income than we typically serve, but I think it is a good thing because a lot of households are seeking units and these disaster areas need to house a lot of different kinds of households. We can still house someone making much less, they're just allowed to make up to this amount. 
right? So you could have two earners earning 40000 or so a year, and they'd still be eligible. Do you know what Hopkins County is? Just is anybody got it on there? I didn't bring my full print out. I knew someone was going to ask. I can send you the full list. Good, yeah. This is just a, you know, a sampling of our overall list. We can get it to you. Wendy, what's exciting about this is, like, our school teachers will now be able to qualify. Yeah. You know, and those are people that are working really hard and have a huge responsibility in our community that have been left out of affordable housing right. because they just make this much too much. Right. Well, and the way HUD approaches median incomes, you know, in a lot of our eastern and western Kentucky counties, because overall countywide median income is low, then you take 60% of that and you're just, you're eliminating a lot of folks from being able to to be eligible. So we are, and our partners across East and West Kentucky really advocated for going up to 120. They, they want to be able to serve kind of middle income folks too. Mm -hmm. I assume it'd be like your other programs that have qualified on the front end, uh, yes. even if their income went up. Yes, later, it's at, it's at the qualification. Like when they, when they qualify for the program, uh, it, let's say they qualify and they're at 120, but by the time they buy the house, they're at 122%, doesn't matter. If they rent, and they, they start renting at 120% AMI, but their income goes up, it doesn't, that's fine. We don't kick them out, we don't. Okay. And to answer your question, uh, Hawkins County has the same limits as ADR on the first one. Okay, cool. Okay, so they revert to the state, yeah. A lot of the target counties that we have yeah, mapped for you all are gonna revert to this state, this, this amount that's in bold. That's the state median, where we're saying it's the greater of either or, because the local county income would have been low. I'm going to pause there. Those are the overall, right? That's what applies to, doesn't matter what kind of project you're doing. Now I'm shifting to single family projects. And when we say single family, what we really mean is owner occupied. Either it's an existing homeowner that needs repair, you know, restoration, elevation, or it's you're building new houses for new buyers. So we're, we're shifting into a little more of a focus area. We will also talk about multifamily. Next slide, Sam. Okay, so there are two areas. I kind of already gave that away. Home repair, recovery, and reconstruction. So these are housing solutions for disaster survivors. We're not going to do this for just someone whose house is dilapidated, at least not with this money, whose house is dilapidated and they need it fixed up if they weren't a disaster survivor. So I want to make sure that's clear. We're focused on disaster survivors, at least with, with this money, for home repair. That's not the case for these single-family home buyer developments. These are new homes that will prioritize disaster survivors, but they will not be exclusive to disaster survivors. A, that's too tricky, it's too hard to make sure, and B, just getting more units to these housing markets will be good for everybody there. So we're going to prioritize survivors, but it's not exclusive to them, these homes. Yeah. So if you, have, if, you have a, if you have three people in line, the disaster surviving, it's probably going to get problems. Yeah. Is that going to be like a What we've number? talked about is a time thing. Like it might be for the first X months, they're only available to survivors. You know, like you have to market your house first to survivors, but then after that you can sell it to other folks. We, we've talked about trying to, or we have a, like a, a home buyer waiting list. We haven't figured out exactly how, but some way to prioritize disaster survivors. Okay, next slide. Okay. So um, I've already shared with you all, we have done uh, meetings in May with East and West Kentucky Partners about these single family, um, and you guys have a copy of this draft notice of funds available. It's like the announcement of a funding round. We've already shared with partners so that they could say, well, that won't work. Well, what about this? Well, have you considered this? Because we wanted their, their feedback. Next slide, Sam. Okay, so for home repair, recovery, and reconstruction, the purpose is to is assist existing homeowners to achieve a housing solution that is disaster resilient, affordable, and sustainable over time. So this means if it's in a flood area, it's elevated. If it was in West Kentucky, it has a fortified roof, right? It, we want it to be affordable to them, we want them to be able to stay in it over time, and we want it to be disaster resilient. Can I ask a question? Sorry, I'm asking a Yes, sir. Uh, when you say disaster resilient, one of the things, it seems like they're putting these storm shelters in all these homes. I, I get it, but I don't get it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Are these going to be required to have storm rooms in them or not? We have not done that. We have talked about like making sure a bathroom has like certain kinds yeah, of walling in it, wall. so that it yeah, so that it would be safe. Okay. Plus the fortified roof, strapping down to the foundation, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah. I just want to make sure we're we, not requiring a five thousand dollar item for a house. We have not. Okay. Although I mean I don't know what a fortified roof costs. I, <laughs> my understanding is that the fortified roof does not cost that much more mm -hmm. than you know a regular. It's just a matter of the expertise right. and installing it properly. So. And I have to say, like part of what we're after with with the Rural Housing Trust Fund and the CDBG disaster recovery is. Uh, there, there could be a couple of long-term benefits with some of our builders uh, across the state in that they learn how to just build disaster resilient as a matter of course. They're just okay. gonna, they're gonna learn kind of new approaches. They also might learn new um, building technologies so that we can get units to market faster, you know, um, and they're disaster resilient, energy efficient, all that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, the eligible households. Um, so I've already said they've got to be a disaster survivor. They also obviously have to have an ownership interest in the land and the home. I know that's a dub, but we like to spell stuff out. And the eligible properties. These are single family homes. They can be factory built, provided they're qualified. They've got to own the land and the factory built home. Um, they've got to be their primary residence, right? We're not fixing up second homes for people or vacation homes, cabins in the woods that they visit once. We're not doing that. Um, and the home cannot be in the floodplain or the special flood hazard area unless it is approved via a KHC waiver request. I want to highlight this, right? With the CDBG disaster recovery money that's coming for East Kentucky, we are going to allow doing home repair reconstruction elevation with CDBG DR. It's going to have to be elevated though. We would like to not do that with these dollars in the floodplain because that is going to be very costly. Helping folks figure out, can we elevate your house? Do we need to build you a new house up on the piles? Where on your land, or do we need to move you? That's just going to be very expensive. We'd rather do that with that big chunk of federal money than with this relatively small $10 million. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanna make that clear to you all. This is a policy decision that we are recommending because we are going to allow this with the CDBG DR money. Did they redraw your flood maps? It's in process. Isn't it? Don't know? Well, south of, in the greater Prairie County area, there's, uh, they released a whole bunch, team released a whole bunch of updates, or proposed updates last October. Uh, but there's nothing that's been finalized yet. So most of the active flood maps uh, that have been released, uh, depending on where you are, date from anywhere from 2006 to 2013. Um, so they're really out of date. Uh, but per, per HUD, if we're using any of the federal dollars for these projects, HUD requires that you look not only at the existing FEMA firm maps that are in place, but any pending ones to use these on. more restrictive analysis based on what the data that's available, particularly when looking at floodplain direction. So there are uh, floodplain maps out there that are representative of the latest floods. And so not, not necessarily. It's for some areas. It's yeah, but, but also it might not even represent the latest flood because FEMA had started the, and the Army Corps had started their reevaluation process years prior to the disaster. Mm -hmm. That's going to be bad. The bureaucracy is fine. Right. To these houses. And then all of a sudden it comes into a flood zone, and then they have the mortgage on it. And all that, all of a sudden, they had to start paying flood insurance. Yeah. That's be pretty bad. Right. And that's going to be a, a real big deal. So, what I would encourage folks to do FEMA releases the preliminary maps on their website uh, so you can search them at the FEMA Flood Map Center. Um, so, it's always a good idea before you buy a property or anybody doing that, yeah. check that out because that could have a But our understanding is, is that the, the maps will change and will be, even if it's not reflective of the 22 flood, it will be. Yeah, and, and one expensive. thing, not knowing how FEMA's bureaucracy works exactly, uh, they might be holding off on releasing those 2022 updates because they want to update them further to reflect the impacts of the prior disaster. Mm -hmm. well, I tell you, I, I've seen it. I've had, I had a lone customer that wasn't in the flood zone. All of a sudden, they drew it in the flood zone. Her first uh, annual insurance was $300. Fast forward five or six years, it was in the thousands of dollars. Yeah. It pushed her out of the house. I'm so if you got a low income person that you're rebuilding a the house, right. hey buddy, you're doing good, and then all of a sudden, oh by the way, you can start paying flood for right. that. Good. With the CDBGTR money, we have written into the plan to HUD that we will we will consider paying flood insurance for folks at 80% of area median income and below. We're allowed to do that because. I mean, I'd like to get everybody out of the floodplain, but this might not be possible. We can elevate them, but they still might be in the flood hazard area. 
Um, but the New York Times had an article this week or last week that said it was about kind of how insurance disasters are affecting insurance everywhere. But they specifically cited that for East Kentucky, flood insurance is expected to triple, mm -hmm. which just makes it, you know. Uh, I'll say one thing about that. Uh, what they did, the Corps of Engineers came to Harlem with the flood, uh, as I was the 77 flood. And I had two residences in the flood zone. I built it three feet or four feet, a fourplex back, took the money from those they bought, above the flood plain as it was then. I got a mortgage on the building. And then sometime later, then I get something, and I have to fight with the Corps of Engineers. The road is the flood plain level, and I built it three feet just in case. So tell your customers, and you all need to fight for them, and I'll say this, the banking industry, the lending industry, and them's one helps insurance and benefit. And it was wrong. I won't pay it. And I said, just do what you want to do. I'll see you in court. Because I have the document showing that that was above the floodplain. And the bank said, well, we have the, I said, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. Try to foreclose on me, and I'll see you in federal court. Right. So, but I'm a lawyer who can do that. So poor people can't. So just remember that they will do that for you. It ain't the bank's bank. And that's the that's the core of engineers trying to change things in the middle of the stream. And that's part of why we would just like to not do work in the flood zone with this money. But make people get when they do that, get that paperwork and hang on to it, like I did, buying the calculation certificate. Okay. And I had the maps and everything that the engineer did it, and we put it three feet above their block. Oh, yeah, but the problem is they can they can change that later. They ain't gonna change it on me because I got a contract with that bank that you can't come in and make me change. I'm just telling. You. I, <laughs> I didn't go to law school for nothing. It's, it's the government. Uh, well. Yeah, I just I I didn't pay it. I paid it. Yeah, and the bank had not four on the, me either. Uh, huh? Army Corps is the fourth branch of government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that contract I got is what the binding law is, and that's and I had the document to show it. You can't change a contract in the middle of the stream. Yeah, yeah, the bank can't, the Corps of Engineers can't. I'm with you, but I, they'll, they'll do it. Now, just tell your people they can't. That's can all they got to do is talk to a lawyer. To <laughs> okay, so again, with this home repair, recovery, and reconstruction, the max assistance that we have, have drafted so far is for a repaired or rehabbed home, $60,000. For a reconstructed home, $100,000. That's how much can stay in permanently meaning we're offsetting the overall cost. They may have FEMA money, insurance money, they might take out a small mortgage, what have you. They can bring other funds to it or they, there might be other programs. We're saying how much of our money can stay in permanently. Um, so the eligible activities is basically fixing up the home to meet, KHC already has minimum habitability standards. We already have them published, our partners already know them. If you're building a home or rehabbing a, a home, like a vacant house and you're rehabbing it, it has to meet what we call our design guidelines, which are much more robust uh, design guidelines for new construction. So what I'm trying to get across to you all is we already have set guidelines that our partners know how to build to or repair to, and we would just use those, again, with the aim of speed. Um, and then the legislation requires a deed restriction for 10 years. Any property that we assist, doesn't matter what kind, what income, it's a 10-year deed restriction. In some cases, we may also record a, 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 a soft mortgage, meaning they don't pay on it, and it will forgive over time, but just so that folks don't take out a predatory loan or turn around and sell their house immediately or what have you. We already do that with our other programs. Quickly, before you yeah. go on, site built, factory built, and modular allowed. Mm -hmm. That does not, those are no words that refer to manufactured, right? I mean, you would Factory do, built could be factory manufactured. Yeah. Okay. Again, it's got to meet our okay, design let guidelines. Let me rephrase, because mm -hmm. everybody uses all these terms. Yeah. Can a mobile home fit in this program? On a chassis? On a chassis. Um, or even one of those that come down the highway in two pumps. Mm -hmm. In theory, yes. So it has to be fixed. It has to be a fixed foundation. Okay. It has to become real property. Okay. It can't be chattel property. Right? And we are, per our design guidelines, we do have manufactured housing guidelines and we're going to update those. We would want, and we've been talking with the Kentucky Manufactured Housing Institute and FAHI about getting some home designs where there is a porch. There is, uh, it doesn't look like it came in 
you know, on a, on a semi, so that it looks like a stick-built house. And it has energy efficiency and all of the disaster resilience. They can kind of build anything in a factory. What you're seeing when you go to the retail lot is not their, the highest thing they can build. But do those appreciate? Because that's one of the things that is the concern, the wealth building opportunities mm -hmm. of Eastern Kentucky. It is that all depends on the construction. Okay. Like what was used to build it? What does it look like? How is it fixed to the foundation? It's all going to come down to that. We have, trust me, Sandy, our partners have been very clear that they do not want junky mobile homes. Mobile homes. They also don't want junky st site, uh, stick built homes, sure. right? They want this to look like Gurney's bed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. It can't be a single wide mobile home because you cannot surrender those to the property. No. So it would have to be a double wide or better. Okay. I think the law allows even a single wide to become a fixation on the property through a legal process. Maybe. I've never seen it happen. Yeah, but, uh, I think most, that's, most programs that I deal with that, that are kind of like this, they just say, no, I think the statute way. allows a mobile home, either one of them, to a process, to the PBA office, to file an act, you've got to get a lawyer to do it, but you can make a mobile home a piece of the property, just like a house now. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's restricted to a mm -hmm. modular, I've, we've done it in the past, I have, but the other lawyer that works for me has. I, I will say what we're trying to work on. You can do that with your process when you loan them the money. Once they get it, you have the ability to do that. But you you elevate it and put the blocks around it and cement do a cement foundation. It becomes the same as a house. Our focus is going to be trying. We're trying to work out with the manufactured housing industry a way for our developers to be the purchasers of home where they would say these are the specs that we want. And what we did is we got from HDA and from Homes Inc. Give us the five home plans that you typically build, including some of those at Gurney's Bend. And we're going to take those to the manufactured housing folks and say, what could you deliver to the site that would look as much like this and be built as much like this as possible so that driving down the street, you might not know which one is which. Um, that is our aim. But our aim is not for people, for homeowners to retail buy from the retail lots. It would be wholesale purchases from our builders that we work with all the time so that they are kind of policing the quality, the look, the finishes, and all that kind of stuff. So and your, that they can make some money in the process. So is your agency is it going to notify the public of that process? What, tell me more about what you mean by that. I'm well, not sure what the people that's going to be helping through this loan process, because you're going to get somebody that's going to go buy one. I'm sure the banks know that. They'll go buy one. They'll finance it through that finance company. Then they want to use the process of putting it on that piece of property. To Depending on how it's built and fixed to the foundation and the size, it, it can become real property. It's, it doesn't even, it's not chattel property at all. It, it will become real property. Yeah, there's a legal process. Dude. You have to do that. You have to surrender the title. Yeah, you, you have to mm -hmm. actually file an action. But for modular, you do not. That's only if it comes in on a, on a chassis. If it's true manufactured modular, comes in very similarly, but it's not on any steel chassis. Okay. You, can, you can take your two by six. They're, they're well built. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, yeah I don't have a problem with that. And they, they just, appreciate. Yeah, uh, double exactly. wides for the last eight years have appreciated. So the thing that I would want to put my money in, and this isn't my money, but I guess we're kind of. We, we it is. It is. So I would not want to put my money in a single wide, yeah. whether I could surrender it or not. I agree. You know, it's just there. There's more limitations to it. Well, my concern is only in the wealth building of the individuals yes. in our area. And if we put them in under a roof that it depreciates like a car over time, they, we've done nothing for them that's, that's for the long great. term. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that's my. That's mm -hmm. the only reason. I'm we have the same concern them. for stick. Sure. Like if it's kind of a junky yeah. stick built. You know, we want these to be uh, homes that are considered an asset, yes. you know? Yes. But well, they're building single lines now that qualify too. That you can bring them in and set them up. And if you got like, there's a lady that I'm thinking about, hers got tore up bad in Metro County. Uh, the reason I know is the news media, grabbed me, some woman come right out there and out of, took me up there, I had to go up there out of, about the news I was working, but hers would be the one that would worry things. She, she just needs a single wide, mm -hmm. and she could elevate above the flood there, no problem, and affix it to the property, which would qualify. I mean, I know what he talked about, modern. I've 
if, if I was going to do it a single wide, I'd spend the money to build a stick yeah. road. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could have almost the same square footage in a, in a more sound house than a single wide. But, I, you know, that's just... Oh, I know. She'd have, the thing is, she'd have to wait. They got built funding and all that. See, that's the whole mm -hmm. problem. you got you got to do a problem where they need somewhere to go for the... Right. For the year that it's going to take to get it all through the process, get built and all that, that's right. It's a double problem there where people got to show. And I want to make it clear. So we've had a bunch of conversations with Bahi and our East Kentucky partners, and even Community Ventures, which is focused on West Kentucky. They're looking at modular and manufactured. Uh, I would just ask that you uh, hold your stigma, but also be open to the possibility that there are designs that you would really, really dig. Because Winston and I went to the manufactured home show in Louisville. And there are some, there are houses there that are nicer than the ones our partners are building. Um, not nicer than Gurney's Bend, they're on par with Gurney's Bend. But like other houses that our partners have built in the past, these houses were, and they were cute, and they had, you could add a garage, you know, porches. I just think um, we are gonna have to bring so many units to East and West Kentucky in a very short period of time. We do not have the builder capacity to do it. We're gonna have to look at a whole lot of stick build, um, uh, you know, the Home Buyers uh, Association has contacted us. We're, we have to look at that. We're going to have to look at all of our existing partners ramping up. I know HGA Hazard has doubled the size of their carpentry group because they know it's coming. Sure. But it's going to kind of have to be all options on sure. on deck. Sure. But I, I don't worry, Sandy. The partners have made it clear they do not want it just to be just quick. They want it to be quality. An asset and quick. And sometimes I'd like to have a conversation on how the insurance industry on these better manufactured homes, how they respond. Because one of the other hidden costs is the inability to insure the manufactured homes. Uh, and so I'd love to know more about if they look better and are better. But and if they become real property, right. then you ought to be able, if it's good construction, you ought to be able to get your home, regular homeowners insurance. Are you thinking that ad districts are going to market in something like this? Is that just how this repair work is going to be marketed? I'll be honest, we haven't gotten that far for the marketing. Our thought was that the first focus would be um, looking at the long-term recovery groups, which a lot of ads are on, like because they often have lists of people who their home needs this, their home needs this, or people who are living still in a, a FEMA trailer or a KYEM trailer or a state park or double up a family. Those are the two lists we were going to focus on for these two kinds of housing. Next slide. Okay, so I just wanted to give you all like a, a, an example of what this could look like, really two examples. Um, so let's say that for the first homeowner, they have re repair, rehab costs, elevation, wind resistance, whatever it is, totaling $80,000. That's how much they need. They got some FEMA or homeowners insurance, whatever whatever it is, of twenty thousand dollars. So our assistance in the end would be sixty thousand dollars, right? We're not going to duplicate what they got from insurance or FEMA or some other source. We might fund the full eighty, and then we get paid back on the back end, right? This might get held in escrow. We're kind of figuring that out. So we might fund all of it, but in the end, some of it gets recycled back into the RHTA. Under this other consideration, if you're rebuilding a home for this homeowner, and that is going to be $150,000 to do all of the rebuilding. I wish we could do houses for this much. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little low. And let's say, again, they have that $20,000, we'll just say it's FEMA assistance, right? So they really need one hundred and thirty, dollars but we're offering a hundred dollars in our money permit. That was the, the limit that we listed. So they would need to, either of their money or a mortgage, get $30,000. Is that, you know, is that making sense to you all? Yeah. Now we, again, we might fund the entire 150 on the front end for speed, but we would have to get paid back so that only 100 stays in at the end. So would you subordinate the other bank? Um, after, we would be the probably the construction yeah. lender, so we wouldn't have to subordinate during construction, although we have. But then at the end, we this would, um, yes, this would subordinate after the first mortgage. And that's what we typically do with all our programs. We're in second position for it. The FEMA checks have been 32000 like for the next month. Right. I just made up, I just wanted easy money. <laughs> <laughs> next slide. 
Okay, so that is for repair and reconstruction for survivors of the disasters, right? Now we're moving on to single family development, prioritizing survivors, but it could be a lot of different kinds of home buyers, right? This is a broader spectrum of folks in East and West Kentucky who might buy the houses that are built. So this purpose is to bring new home ownership units that meet our design guidelines to disaster impacted areas to attract and retain moderate and low income buyers. So it's a, it's a bigger goal, not just about serving those disaster survivors. And this is home construction. Again, it's got to meet our existing design guidelines. Um, it can be the construction of replacement housing that if we build it on their land, we call it reconstruction. If we're building them a house in like a new subdivision or a new property outside the floodplain or what have you, that would be part of this program. That says it's a little six and one half dozen another, but I just want to make that clear. Some people will leave one column and go over to the other, right? Um, you can use some of the money to buy uh, land uh, that's outside the floodplain. Um, again, site built, factory built, and modular construction would be part of this. Um, acquisition and rehab of vacant existing homes. You don't want to displace anybody, but if there's a vacant house and you want to rehab it to get a new house on the market, that's okay. Um, site preparation that is necessary for the home construction or delivery. So grading and a culvert, a, a bridge, like if we need to put a bridge in, that kind of stuff, that can be allowable. Um, we can also help the home buyer purchase the home. We can't go over the total of $100,000, but if part of it is to help them with down payment assistance, that's okay. That's, that's the affordability side of it. Um, and then we will allow, in some cases, this is a request of partners, lease purchases where you build a home. That buyer might not be mortgage ready yet, but if they can get mortgage ready, let's say in five years, then they could buy that, get a mortgage and buy the house. Um, several of our Eastern Kentucky partners in particular have said they would like to create opportunities for people to work towards home ownership who might not be mortgage ready just yet. So we're looking at allowing lease purchase. If uh, if they if they aren't able to follow through on the purchase of it and they leave the house, is there going to are there restrictions on the developer that he ha it has to go back to affordable housing? Or? Well, it has to sell to 120 percent of area median income. Okay. So it would it would still have that restriction because that's a 10 year yeah. deed restriction regardless of. Okay. Yeah. That couldn't. We would have to be a home ownership unit, right? right? They couldn't hold on to it for long term rental. We would rather not do a whole lot of single family about. rental. So it's going to have to with be this. A yeah. They could turn right around and do this. They could again. do another lease purchase. Yeah, right. Which would could keep it. I mean, I've done some lease purchases that have stayed where I've held on to them for 20 years yeah. where they failed. And so it, in essence, becomes right. rental property. Right. Okay. It's not a big goal. We added this at the request of some of our East Kentucky partners who are like, we've got folks who we think we could get there, but they're not going to get a mortgage right now. Particularly rates where they are. Next slide, please. Okay, so the um, eligible households would be, they have to acquire ownership in the land and the home. Again, this is kind of getting at that manufactured housing. It's both. It's not a, you know, you're going to own the house, but then lease the land. We want, we want it to be both. Um, and we are going to require that their housing to income ratio be no lower than 10%, no higher than 29%. 10% seems low until you look at how much SSI is, right? That's not, you have folks on fixed incomes who can't afford, they might have owned a house, but they cannot afford a full mortgage and they can't spend 30% of their income on housing. So, but we don't want to go lower than 10, we don't want to go higher than 29 for that front end ratio. That doesn't account for their debt, other debts, but. I think you don't want to go lower than 10. Well, um, we, our partners feel like it's important for a homeowner to have some skin in the game, right? They shouldn't be spending nothing on their, a home ownership unit. Um, and they feel like that is very important. So for some folks, that's gonna mean taxes and insurance. That's all they're paying. They're not even paying more a mortgage necessarily. It might just be tax and insurance. That was our, our partners were like, and I will say this is a little bit of a controversy, particularly in East Kentucky. There are some volunteer groups that are kind of giving away free houses. Our nonprofit partners want it to be a true ownership and equity building situation. So that's why we, we felt like 10% was, it's modest, it's incredibly affordable. 
and they're probably better well maintained. Below that, they got a lot of other options through so housing vouchers and stuff. Too. Right. They probably need to rent if they're if they can't spend ten percent on their housing. You know. Yeah, they probably need to be in public well, they housing. Don't, they don't some autos a month SSI. They ain't, don't can't hardly pay their electric and right. bills. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's all SSI pays. Yeah. Um, again, this is $100,000 that can be permanently invested in the home, uh, and that is the sum of what we call affordability gap, so helping the buyer, and development gap, which is the cost to build the house. In some markets, it's going to cost more to build the house than it will appraise at, and you've got a gap. You also might have a buyer who can only borrow this much or afford this much, but, but this is how much the appraised value is. And so we will use appraised value to determine where the gap is. And our partners are very used to this. We have all kinds of underwriting stuff that they fill out when they come to us for money. Again, we will finance 100% uh, of construction, but some of it might be paid back because we cannot go above the 100K permanent investment. And it's a 10-year um, deed restriction. And we will probably do a mortgage for any direct assistance to the buyer. So if we give them a down payment assistance, we will probably record that as a mortgage forgiven over time. So it might be two documents recorded. And so here's another example. So this is for when we're building a house. Let's say the cost to build a home is $200,000 for home buyer one. The appraised value is $150,000, right? So you can see there, there's the gap already. There's a $50,000 what we call development gap. The market will not appraise out to cover all development costs. The buyer, in this case, can get a loan of $140,000, and the down payment is $5,000. So the affordability gap that they have is just $5,000, right? They've got $5,000, they got a mortgage for $140,000, so they're bringing $145,000 to it, it's appraising at 150, that's what we always sell at is appraised value. So they just need $5,000 in help directly to the buyer. And the final amount of RHTF is the 50,000 development gap and the 5,000 affordability gap. For home buyer two, again, it's the same house, $200,000 to build, it appraises at 150. The development gap is the same, it's $50,000. But this buyer can only get a mortgage. Their purchase power is just $100,000. They can't get a big mortgage. They do not have down payment. They're going to need $50,000 to be able to buy the house. So the total is $50,000 in developing gap, $50,000 in affordability gap, up to our max of $100K. These numbers will change. It's not a set amount. It is based on what the buyer's income is, how much money they're bringing to it, what their mortgage is, and we will back into how much the buyer needs, and then based on development costs is how we figure out how much the development gap is. So you'll let them do 100% lending on the house? Well, no, we usually, we don't dictate the terms of the lending, that we let the, the mortgage company well, do that. Still, I mean, so for me, if you're subordinating, that's a 50% loan to value. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a, good, it's a deal. good deal, right? But, you know, you mentioned skin in the game a few minutes ago, there's no skin in that game. Well, what we're presuming is that this is probably, this loan represents it between 10 and 29% of their income, this mortgage. They are having a $100,000 mortgage. And also the mortgage uh, will be forgiven over time, right? Over the course of that 10-year period, 10-year affordability period, it will be forgiven. So, you know, after the first year, maybe 10% of the mortgage, of the, of the note amount is forgiven. So they have, they'll have that 10% of that they will build equity. They will have to bring their financing. We just don't dictate if they have to have a, a down payment or not. We let the lender do that. All right, next slide. Okay, so um, I wanted to share with you all, there are, um, the legislation offers you priorities for funding projects. We wanted to recommend to you all additional priorities for single family projects. And they are as follows. Projects in those most impacted um, counties, and I got Warren right here, Sam, right? I'm proud of me. <laughs> so those are those bolded counties on our list, um, because those were the hardest hit in the, in the two disasters. We would like to focus on those. Readiness to proceed, meaning they've got site control, they either own it or they have a purchase contract on land, or they've got an agreement with the local government to use that land. Um, they've got an existing waiting list of people who need repairs or home, pre-approved homebuyers, whatever it is, something that demonstrates to us they're ready to go. 
Um, the number of units, so scale, because we would like to get a lot of units done. It doesn't have to be all on one site. It could be they own five different pieces of property, and, and that gets them to some scale. Experience in doing development uh, and projects that are going to house disaster survivors um, that are still in shelter, doubled up, all that kind of stuff. We really want that. Um, establish relationships and mechanism to ensure a pipeline of survivors and new homeowners. Show to us you know how to get people in the door qualified and get them into housing. We want this to move well and move fast. Um, demonstrated expansion of capacity. I mentioned how HDA has doubled their carpentry crew. That'd be a great demonstration of expanded capacity. Or they uh, created partnerships with home builders you know, in nearby. Whatever it is, something that shows us you're going to be able to do more than you've probably typically done with KHC money. And then the last one, demonstrated financial capacity, right? If we're going to do two and a half million dollars for grant, we just want to know you have good checks and balances, you've been able to manage large amounts of money. We, we want this to move fast, and we don't want um, any fraud, any loss, any of that kind of stuff, of course. Any questions about those priorities? I'm interested in if you all feel like those seem on track. Do you anticipate, like, companies coming from out of state wanting to play in this game? And, uh, you know... And I mean, I think a lot are interested in that CDBGDR money. Oh, I, I don't know if they know about this yet, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, we re and I will say that we want to focus on those who already have proven experience sure. in these regions and with KHC programs, because this isn't that much money and we want to move fast, so we don't have time to teach people how to do mm -hmm. all, all of what we do. The, the CDBGDR money is probably going to require bringing in new partners and growing capacity. I'm not trying to do it with, with this. You don't require volume capacity development? Well, we do typically for multifamily. We don't often for single family. We're going to have to think about that but with this much money. Scale, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, though. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now um, I'm. Uh, we've already talked about the flood, but I can go on to the next slide. Okay, now this is a far fewer number of slides you'll be relieved to know. I want to share with you our approach for multifamily. Again, this is Western Kentucky, right now at least, because we have not set aside dollars for multifamily in East Kentucky. Um, I will say, though, I want you all to know, we do, um, it's so hard not to get really wonky with this policy stuff, we do every year what are called 9% tax credits. They're they're even more competitive and desirable. They fund about 60 to 70 percent of project costs. We have in our um, our next funding round for those, we have carved out a pool of the nine percent tax credits for East Kentucky, so that one or two multifamily projects could hopefully happen in East Kentucky. East Kentucky has not been competitive for those tax credits because it's hard to get scale, it's hard to get land, all that kind of stuff. We wanted to kind of create like, it's almost like you're not even competing with anybody, it's got its own pool. That is separate from what I'm talking about now, I wanna make that clear. Okay, so for the multifamily activities, which right now again will be West Kentucky, we're gonna focus on new construction, so not, we're not talking about renovating existing rentals or anything like that, it's just not enough money or time in the day. We wanna focus on new development, to support disaster recovery. Um, again, we did a March uh, forum with our multifamily developers across the state to, along with DLG, to share with them the approach we were thinking about taking so they could ask questions. Their biggest takeaway was your gap uh, a dollar amount was not enough per project. You need to, you, DLG needs to put more gap funds into, into make these projects work. Um, but it was a really informative, good, good forum. So uh, what we're going to do is that $5 million will go into multifamily projects in West Kentucky. Um, I've kind of gone over this already, if you want to go to the next slide, Sam. And so we are going to make $50 million of our tax-exempt bonds available for West Kentucky multifamily development. So that's $50 million of bonds. There's an associated amount of what are called 4% tax credits, and we'll bore you all with that. And then the CDBG DR money from DLG and Rural Housing Trust Fund. So you can see we're stacking a bunch of sources together to try to make some multifamily projects in the tornado hit counties, you know, viable to get some stuff built in rural areas. Um, again, and we will focus on Warren, Graves, Hawkins, and Breathitt for this note. We're going to focus on those most impacted counties. 
Now, bread that's in Eastern Kentucky, right? It is. Uh, the lecture in. Uh, I don't know if you want to go now. into. So, um, the tax exempt bond program really requires scale. You need a large number of units um, because the soft costs are so high. Um, and this is kind of getting into the, some of the like details of how these projects work. The soft costs are so high that they have to be spread out over a large number of units. Um, historically, tax exempt pro tax exempt bond projects work really well in higher population places. Um, we do a lot of these projects in Louisville. Um, we've done a few in, in Bowling Green and some of the other like um, higher population areas throughout the state. But they don't really work as well in rural areas um, such as Eastern Kentucky. So um, even though, the, but the challenge here is that we're, we're combining these funds with the 2021 CDBG DR funding, which includes Warren, Graves, Hopkins, and, and Breathitt. Um, as eligible counties for those funding. So we're including them because we're using the CDBG DR funds, but we do not expect yeah. um, really any applications for a multifamily project to, to happen in Breathitt County. Yeah, there's... Well, I got, I got a thing from the Floyd County judge who's got, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how many acres, but it's designed, I've got it, he sent it to me. So, so... I mean, what's, what's multiple mean? So yeah, so for for tax exempt bond bond projects, you're looking at a minimum of 100 units. Okay. Yeah. So very very yeah, large right. scale. It's really like the largest types of projects that we do, and sometimes it can be broken up across different counties. But again, that adds costs. So um, it's it's really challenging. We have other we have other sources of funding like the nine percent tax credit that we're going to be using in Eastern Kentucky. I don't know of any hundred. Yeah, no. any, exactly. Any part of either county. It's not. It's, it, it really. It's a. That's it's a, a hospital. Great tool. That's a hospital right. issue. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great tool that we have to create housing, but it only works in certain areas. So we're. That, that's kind of why we're approaching it. This way. So DLG is requiring that their money, at least in theory, be offered to Breathitt, but the rural housing trust fund dollars, are the five million that we're going to put into this process, is Warren Graves and Hopkins. East Kentucky is better off with those nine percent tax credits. It's just a lot more money per project, and it's gonna you could do you don't have to do hundred units. Just being more. Sure. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we will what we will do is fill gaps in the development of these rental projects, um, and we don't have a per unit max or anything like that yet. We want to see what comes in and what makes sense, what we can get for the five million in rural housing trust fund plus these other funds stacked together. Will there be a priority to do at least one development in each of those three counties? Or is that, could, I mean, I, I hate to see Warren County get it all. Right. <laughs> well, it, uh, Bowling Green can't get it, so it, it, um, Warren County probably won't get it That's all. right. That's right. <laughs> right? Um, I think with the bonds, you know, we were thinking we want to hit as many counties as yes. we can. Okay. Right. Um, we know that it, it's better, you know, if we've got a multi-site project to include Warren County because you know you've got larger population there, right. it helps support mm -hmm. an, a, another smaller project mm -hmm. in another county. Um, but we're we're hoping to, to be able to hit as many. Okay. I mean, we could consider that as a preference yeah. in the NOFA to say, you know, projects that have geographic coverage across multiple counties will be funded before others. You know, and um, you're good. You go to next. Okay, so then we also wanted to offer you all our recommended priorities for multifamily projects. They're not all that different, they are fewer. Um, so again, those most impacted and distressed Western Kentucky counties, Warren, Graves, and Hawkins. Readiness to proceed, again, we think that's really important. Experience in developing multifamily housing using KHC sources. The way we do stuff in these tax credits, it's very unique, it's very niche. I mean, we have a lot of developers, they're primarily for profits, some nonprofits, but um, that's going to be really key. Um, demonstrated financial capacity to carry out larger scale projects, and then um, they have to get awarded the tax exempt bond. We're, we're going to package this all together. We're just saying we're not going to fund you with Rural Housing Trust Fund if you didn't also uh, qualify for our tax exempt bonds and in, in tax in tax credits. It's going to go together. Next slide. Okay, and then this is just the anticipated, please don't hold us to this. This is our anticipated timeline, right? You all are meeting in July uh, and August. We think in July we can do the single family funding round. In August we expect to do the multi-family funding round. And so in late July, that would be our goal, fingers crossed, 
for the first awards, they would be single family, to be made. And then in August, the first awards for those most ready projects, for single family projects, that we might get the money out in August. And so to have legislation pass in March and be ready to deploy funds in August, it's a lot faster than we typically work. Yep. But, but this is what this money's for. I'll call you in August. <laughs> <laughs> and the board's role in this part, I mean, are we just going to, like, in six months meet, you're going to tell us how you just deployed the money, or are you going to say, hey, guys, you guys have got to approve these expenditures? Uh, Sam, I'll let you speak to so, that. So uh, the, the role of the committee is really advisory, so advising right. on policy matters. Um, I think that, you know, we will... We anticipate um, the next meeting would be to, to provide you with an update on what areas have been funded. So, you know, KHC is the, is the entity that's kind of charged with, um, you know, actually reviewing the applications and making awards. Um, you all would be, you know, here's here's here are the policy decisions that we made on the front end, and here's here's the units that we ended up creating on right. the back end. And so, your board would approve those. Actually, the KHC board does not approve individual funding applications. Okay. We do a competitive scoring process and have a committee of staff mm -hmm. that, you know, score pro we do capacity review. You've got to make it through that and thresholds, and then we score projects across a team of people. Okay. Um, we, we try to, that keeps uh, you all from being lobbied, okay. right? Um, and it keeps it to be this a project a process whereby if there's an open records request we can provide all the score sheets all the comments you know um, that's how we do all of our programs our board does not approve individual projects okay. or events bottlenecks too a little bit okay. <laughs> as someone who's sometimes the bottleneck <laughs> the only exception to that is for tax exempt bonds our board has to approve the issuance of the bonds okay. yes. so that at that point the board will will make the approval. But they're not selecting the projects. They're not selecting the yeah. projects, they're just approving the issuance of the bonds. Thank you for that in-depth, comprehensive, uh, <laughs> that's a compliment, uh, <laughs> presentation. I think it's great for us to get a moment to really get down the brass tack and, and see what you all are about to deploy. And, and I would agree that for you all to pass legislation and get money out the door, have it out here in a few months that's pretty good so uh, this time it's like opened up general discussion to see if there's any other items that uh, we'd like for them to look at and then we don't have to vote on anything we're here to provide input and maybe retooling or sharpen the knife a little bit so the floor is yours i'd just like to compliment wendy i mean and staff uh, it's uh, it makes me feel good that we're going to get things rolling and start seeing houses built and work done in our areas uh, it, it gives me a lot of confidence we knew that was the question you were going to have <laughs> i just have questions about the trust fund in general yeah so the idea is that this money goes out will the trust fund be expended or will it be repaid and such so that it's perpetual the way we have crafted this yeah. is that most of this money it might recycle but we would keep deploying it to East and West Kentucky until it's gone because some does get sunk, right? Okay. If it's all debt, then it's not really going to help. So the trust folks. fund is not forever. It is. It's got a, what's probably a smaller lifespan. Okay. Right. Okay. It might. So let me. So, the. Oh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I was, I was going to say. So, so there's there's a distinction between the trust fund itself mm -hmm. and the sources of of dollars that are going in to fund you know the money that's that's going to end up going out. The trust fund itself will exist as long as it, the statute is there. Okay. Um, there just not be any funding source okay. that goes into it. So on the the other trust fund that we administer, the affordable housing trust fund, that gets funded on a, on a consistent basis from a portion of the recording fees from the county clerks. So that that you know every every time a mortgage is recorded, there's a portion of that fee that goes to the affordable housing trust fund, and that's how that one continuously gets funded. Okay. Here we don't have that source here. Really, it's just a one-time infusion of $10 million for Western Kentucky and $10 million for East Kentucky. Okay. And so, you know, if the legislature decides to put so more funds right. into this into this fund, then then, then we would have um, Or if they came use. up with a mechanism for mm -hmm. being able to fund it that way. Or if there were fi private philanthropy that went into it and those types of things. So that leads to my second question. 
if a future, if a flow of funding became available for that, would we then, how much of its original designation for those eight counties, seven counties, uh, is that permanently attached to the trust fund, or is that something that it could then say, hey, now it's just rural? Yeah, so, so the, the designation of those counties comes from the legislation that puts the money into the trust fund. It doesn't okay. come from the trust fund legislation itself. Ah, okay. So, so any future s sources of funding that are different from the WK save the EK save funds, um, you know, may they may have their own, uh, it may have their own set of criteria that we gotcha. have to use the funding for. But the rural housing trust fund, it's really just those criteria that are listed in the statute that that Wendy talked about earlier. So it could become a statewide rule yeah. trust fund in the future, if the if different money were it funneled into it. Yeah. Now, now you said some of this money could be revolved, or it may come back to you. So at the subrecipient level, are they able to revolve that money themselves? That's going to be come back into you guys. Our aim is going to be that that they can. We've got to figure out the mechanism for that. Okay. With home funds, we can do that. With HTF, there's something about the statute where we end up having they have to pay us back and we refund them. We're trying to map that out. Okay. I figure out how we can so do I was wondering that. how long it would keep its identity and right. if they could revolve on the local level. Well, well, we can talk more about that. You're talking about like if a loan got repaid, if somebody sold the or house. If they, if they, instead of granting it out, it, they did it in a, a loan. Mm -hmm. I just, it's still a 10 year, no matter how the money is used, it's a 10 year deed restriction. Okay. I just didn't know if, they, if some of these small organizations were going to try to revolve that to keep their individual mm -hmm. loan fund going as well. Mm -hmm. so, I'm yeah, just, I don't know. Okay. Or if that's an eligible source, resource. Yeah, but you can stack this with any other funds. Our big aim, though, is move fast. So right. we didn't want to have to have our um, our builders, nonprofit and for profit, doing that lasagna of having to get you know ten sources to make a, a deal happen. Um, like for those of you familiar with Gurney's Bend, I mean they had. <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed when I saw how many different funding sources they had to get. I thought that just shows like our money is definitely not enough, you know, and so we'd like to avoid that if we can. Has there been any studies done to see how much money is needed? I mean, how did y'all come up with the 20? Or is that just, let's try 20 and then if we need more? That's just, I think partners ask, I think partners, partners ask for probably 100 million or something. Yeah. I don't know what they ask for, but I think it's just what seemed like a good start. But did, did they do actual studies? To, to no, I think, I think that was a non-budget year. Yeah. So we transferred funds from what was it, the Western the Kentucky. Yeah, so it's funds. not new fund. We couldn't. <laughs> now this year, we can put specific funds in for the budget if me and my friend and the rest of Eastern Kentucky and all those people yeah. got hit can convince the rest of the block to do it. But that was what that was. That was just a transfer from the emergency funds that they didn't use in Western Kentucky. Well, what's your gut tell you in your area? Do you think that that's enough money to? Oh, ten million won't touch nothing. No, won't touch nothing. Oh no, ten percent. Oh no, nothing for. I mean, you, you just go down. So bad. I drove through uh, Lemony on the other day, and it's mm. cleaned up where I got it cleaned up. But it's just, I mean, up there's a place where a couple was going to put a miser home to get married. She works at Bloomfield, and he's a police officer. Their ice is green and growing up there, but they've not done a thing. And I, but they would have to elevate it to get out of the floodplain. But they could. They want to put a miser. Uh, and uh, I know I've helped do this before uh, to, through the core, which was making the same requirements as this when they moved the, for the road, State Highway moved the uh, migrant home from road, they had to put it eight foot up in the air where the guy put it on new property. Yeah. I had to fight with them to make them comply to get up above that, but they did. They don't want to put it forward. I said, ah, mm -hmm. and he'll be paying flood insurance and for nothing. So. If you get above the floodplain, then there's no flood insurance. That's what I really worry about in your Well, that's the same. Well, but I'm <laughs> going to get somebody the core. That's what I'm going to jump on next, the transportation, to get the core in there, to go up through there and tell those people where the floodplain is. Mm -hmm. So they, they got, see, in Fleming Neon, that water come out of the mountain, and it's never flooded like that. Right. But they think that one time when you get 12 inches of rain yeah. in three hours, oh, now you're in the flood zone. Okay. They remapped our area. And it fills up the river, but they won't let you clean it out, so you're out of the flood zone. Yeah. I mean, it's When they remapped our area in 2010, what they did is they went around to the magistrates and said, hey, 
we can get your people more money if there's flooding. They didn't tell them the back end of it. You can put somebody in the flood zone and they got a mortgage on there. They have to get right. flood insurance. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the bad deal mm -hmm. with FEMA. Oh yeah, and FEMA offered somebody five hundred dollars for everything in their house if destroyed. Yeah. I, I learned from Leon, I said, you people need to pack up and go home. You're the most disgraced, paid citizen that the government ever hired to come in there and tell these poor people. And they tell me, Senator, because it's Senator Turner, it wasn't just Johnny Turner over our work. <laughs> I was supposed to have something that, well, I did when Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul come down there. I told them that they need to send FEMA home because they were, I mean, it was a disgrace what they were telling them. I mean, they'd cry and thought, and I told them, I, I said, ma'am, I don't know where you're from. Well, I'm from Georgia. I said, well, you need to work in Georgia because you know what dollars are worth up here. And it was just a disgrace. I, I, think, I think this board, I think what we could do is let's get the money out. And mm -hmm. Hopefully this creates maybe a framework so that other other powers of be are more comfortable putting more money in. Mm -hmm. That we could show I that think I you, well, you're going to get recommendations yeah, from yeah, him yeah. and him. And uh, this is a good insight. So, so that this we, is like a test mm -hmm. run. I think the right. best thing we could do is probably come, like, you know, in November, have you guys for state and local government to testify what's going on mm -hmm. and say, and what then you, you need. Say, and, yeah. If we had 50 more million in each area, we could really make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. the type of. And, and get your people out in those areas, the hazard, those groups right. lined up, so what they've done and what they are. And, and I want to get with you so that I can send you this. See, the couple of the counties are trying to use coal properties to put numerous houses right but they're going to need the county can't afford it i mean right, right. they want like one thousand dollars for a eight acre tract of land it's already i don't know and by this fall we hopefully will also have a sense of what the community development block grant disaster recovery money is going to look like and do and what that timing is and how where there's going to be gaps what it won't cut we'll have a sense of what that's going to look like even better and see so using that five thousand dollar need where we maybe could help mm -hmm. throw money into one that you don't, where you need funding, mm -hmm. even, if, if you're going to build so everything you can think of that would, that gives me and him and our other cohorts in the area that we live in uh, to uh, bring to the rest of the body to say, here, yeah, it's what we need. So, I really it appreciate it. It's only seven months until General Sumner goes back. Don't roll it now, I know how that works. But it'd be... You know, it would be next year unless we declared an emergency to put it in right in, in, when we first get down there. But we're all keyed up for it. You all needed it. That would be the other thing you could say. We need this mm -hmm. not to wait till we adjourn and yeah. end of the session and stuff. Just We need some urgent funding. Mm -hmm. So that's, think about that. I said one personal comment. Uh, I chair a publicly owned bank, Kentucky Ag Finance Corporation. And so you come across areas that involve agriculture or farms, you know, our interest rate is 2.75%. So a pretty good rate. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and so we're, we're, we're managing about $110 million in the revolving loan portfolio through our office. And so be thinking about that, if there's ways to dovetail uh, farms that were affected. We don't finance housing, but oftentimes the house is on the farm. So, mm -hmm. so just be thinking about that as we come up with some long-term mm -hmm. solutions here. And we, and half of our loans go towards new beginning farmers, so it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty open towards uh, all areas of the state. You do equipment too, right? No. Uh, we, on the county levels, yes. Okay. Just, but we have a lot of criteria. Okay. But we, we like to stick with real property. Any minimum acreage? No. No. And so this would this would finance agribusinesses, not just to purchase of farmland, but also you know structure of farms, etc. It's fences. Um, that's yeah, right. There's a lot of fences that probably still aren't up. That's right. Fences, and then then even if you, if you come across property that that was not previously active with farming, and you find somebody wants to turn it into that business, that would qualify as well. So that's just a discussion we can maybe dovetail our staffs over. Just maybe. So we need a small little farm on every one of our subdivisions. <laughs> <laughs> um, when would we like to meet again this year? So we were thinking November fifteenth. I think that would be a good, you know, the, 
we, we feel that we'll have something to present to you in terms of, you know, what we've gotten out and some well, reports we, on it. That's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Deer season normally comes up in the 10th or 11th, so you might, to to, you might want to start it. You might want to do it the week before. The week before, okay, yeah. we can do that. Eight. 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 All right, I'll write down the number eight, and, and our <laughs> KHC staff <laughs> will we'll keep in touch and send out reminders when that happens. Do you want us to leave these folders here for when we come back, or is this ours? You can take them with you um, and bring them back, and we'll, we'll update you with uh, any additional documentation. Any other announcements from our members? I, I can see now why Stiver's putting in Robbie on here. <laughs> We're not afraid to talk. <laughs> we ask questions. <laughs> I appreciate that. There's a lot, a lot of thoughtful questions, conversation. Uh, advocacy, yeah. I appreciate it. Just uh, real quickly, on behalf of the entire staff, I want to thank you all for being here and for the attention that you're giving to this. Uh, I can certainly say, on behalf of the staff here, they're certainly putting their shoulder to this and have been working really, really hard on not only this, but everything else that Wendy has told you about and, and, and focused on these disaster relief dollars, which hopefully will be coming to us soon. Yeah. So this is a huge effort, uh, something Kentucky Housing Corporation has never been involved in before. I mean, we're not a, built to be a disaster relief agency, and so we're trying to at least provide disaster rebuilding as best we can. But, but they've done a great job. And, uh, well, this will we'll just be open to the. I, guess, I think uh, I'm sure probably Brandon would want to come. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a couple a other meeting. legislators yeah, would want to come. It's a public yeah, meeting. It's a public meeting. Good. Anyone else is welcome. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to. Yeah. And what do you what if, 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 if you propose testifying before one of those committees? Would you want to have this board meet that same day? Would they? Uh, yeah, months. that would be. Uh, let me see. I was just looking at that. Just, just it was. It's not a bad. Well, the the, the testifying would probably just be Wendy and yeah. Sam. Uh, right. So it probably would be any day. But I think it would be really good to do it in October, November. Mm -hmm. Probably the later where you have the most experience mm -hmm. to give us something. Yeah. And I, can, you know, I can control the meetings on. State local government, so I can try to make that in November. Mm -hmm. Don't want to just make a yeah. mental note of that. You make the end of November. Yeah. Yeah. After deer season. <laughs> yeah, after, after we meet again, I yeah. think, yeah. It, I yeah, think it it'd be, be better right after this meeting. Well, again. it would be the last meeting is going to be. Uh, uh, actually, it's early. It's the sixth because of Thanksgiving. So that's the that's the last meeting of of uh, local government. Is it November sixth? November sixth. Okay. Yeah. So if if you all would prefer, we could schedule this body to meet before that. Yeah, yeah I think I think I think it'd be beneficial, it be don't better. you? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be okay. better prepared to know if yeah. to come before they're in the legislative committee. Yeah. We'll, we'll okay. Give you some right. pointers. So we'll communicate that out. Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, I can. Yeah, you can do that. Maybe the end of October today. or something, and then do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did you pick a day? Yeah. We did, can we we did pick? not. <laughs> we, we, we can't. Okay, we can do that. Uh, let's say November 1st. How about okay. that? Because that'll be in advance of the... Okay. That meeting on the 6th and 7th. Just, uh, I, I have a transportation committee at 1. If we wanted to do it... I'll know, be in transportation with you. Yeah. So. If we wanted to do it at 10 or something, yeah. if that would be all right. Give us a little travel time. All of us, me and Johnny, drive three hours. Is that, is that acceptable? 10 o'clock? November 1st? Alright, All right. I'll send it out in an email. But Maybe we'll get some of those house members. Well, we'll, get, yeah, we'll shame them. Yeah, I'll, we'll get them. <laughs> I'll, work, I'll work on that. Yeah. And then you, so what was, what was that transportation? Is one? Yeah, one. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, staff. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we do need a motion and a second to adjourn. The non debate motion. So moved. 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 So moved.